We have an excellent program ahead of us today. We'll start out with our, the favorite topic of all of us, Unicode. How many of you have ever sent an email that looked weird? Well, besides the one at 3 o'clock. Oh, well, maybe not. The first speaker of today is going to be Giuseppe De Angelo, among friends known as Pepe. And uh, those of you that's, that was at the party yesterday, I just have one announcement. Uh, the Barbie Girl performance late in the evening is not going to be put on YouTube. So maybe you shouldn't have left that early. Oh, never mind. Anyway, I uh, was working really hard yesterday getting Pepe drunk because uh, he is one hell of a speed talker and he'll be done with this presentation in five minutes if he, if he wasn't slightly hungover so that we can get the speed down. So give him a That's small right, hand. That's right, yes, Pepe. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Enjoy. Good morning. No kid widgets? Oh, yeah, right. You're right. So I have to remind <laughs> my boss how to do his job. Uh, I'm sorry. So I talked to... Am I on again? I talked to a lot of people yesterday, and there was a lot of people that didn't know about my YouTube career. So for those of you that are on QML and not super hot at QML yet, we have a 47-episode series out on QML, whole training. And for those of you that are on Widget or on QML and just want to learn a bit of other things, uh, we have a... Uh, I think we are up at... 70 episodes or something like that now? 72 at the moment. Uh, on cute widgets and more. And the and more part is everything but not cute widgets. So maybe you should go and check that out. Just go to... Uh thank you, Jesper. And thank you for introducing me. Yeah, very live audience <laughs> after the party. Okay, well, I'll try to take it slow and uh, I will delight you with some Unicode stuff. All right, how I learned to love Unicode and stop worrying. My name is Giuseppe D'Angelo. I work at this very fine establishment called KDAB. I'm actually going to spell what KDAB stands for during this talk, and I'll try my best to pronounce it correctly. Uh, I'm a developer, I'm a software engineer, I'm also a trainer. Some of you uh, have been participating in my earlier training about C++, and that, that's what I do. Ask me about uh, C++, cute core stuff, 3D stuff, Italian stuff. You get it. I will talk about with anyone about anything. Now, I know what most of you are probably thinking right now. Oh, God, it's 9 in the morning, I'm still drunk, and do you really want to talk about strings in Qt? How many times do we have to talk about strings in Qt? How many strings classes are there right now? 10, 15, I don't, lost count. Uh, it is not a talk about strings in Qt. It is also a talk about strings in Qt, but also about something else, okay? This wants to be a talk about Unicode, which probably makes it even harder. Like, how many of you know what Unicode stands for? And every time I have this discussion, yeah, I think, I don't know, I think Unicode is for that uh, UTF stuff that sometimes bites me. I think it's about emojis. Yes, you will see lots of emojis in this talk, but. Okay, it's about fonts, I guess. It's about translations. It's about a little bit of everything. Yes, it's about this and much more. All right, if you want to have a more thorough answer, uh, Unicode is a consortium. It publishes a standard, and that standard wants to define uh, the only way, the correct way to do any sort of text processing. Okay, so it's all about text encoding, text representation, handling of text. And yes, it does include things such as a database of symbol, a un universal character set. Uh, encodings for these symbols, algorithms and other rules for text processing, and a bunch of other technical reports that may or may not apply on your specific domain. The thing is, if you have some doubts about how some text should be processed, you shouldn't worry because likely the fine minds at Unicode have already figured it out for you. And the point of this talk is going to be that actually Qt has implemented a lot of this stuff for you. So you just need to know where to look into Qt. Give you an example of things that matter, and I cannot have a Unicode talk without throwing in a poop emoji. There is a standard, a uh, technical report, UIX31, that def tries to define which should be the allowed identifiers in any programming language. C++ is adopting that standard, and that standard bans emojis as identifiers. So uh, I'm so sorry uh, that 
fact, a couple of years ago, we had a very fun talk about a colleague of mine by Dan. Uh, you can find the talk on YouTube. Actually, if you, I'm going to put a link right here <laughs> when you see this video on YouTube. Uh, it's about a fun talk about throwing in uh, uh, Unicode identifiers inside your source code. Can you do that? Uh, sorry, no, you cannot do anymore. So thanks to Unicode, I cannot have more funny slides because you are not allowing emojis as identifiers anymore. So you cannot throw poop when something goes wrong. But OK, before I actually get started and get into this, let me give you my personal motivation. It's like, OK, who cares? This is tech stuff. Nobody, I mean, I'm not doing a text processor. I'm not handling text. I'm not doing something fancy. Who cares? Well, I do, and your users do too. And to kind of prove my point, at this very conference, there is an associated companion app that you can download, and you can like, look for talks and bookmark your talks. And if you open the description of this talk in that app, that's what you see. Right? OK, so I don't think you want to see that. I don't think your users will be happy at if your application starts showing that instead of showing, well, text that is not supposed to look like that. And yeah, so. This can't, again, as I said, proves, proves my point. It's, uh, it's bad ex user experience if you screw these things up. But it's also bad in terms of, of course, application design, and sometimes you can get things really, really wrong and just do bad processing within Unicode. All right. So I'm not going to give you a thorough introduction to Unicode, but this is a cute conference, and what I want to give you is an idea of the cute facilities for Unicode. Cute has had excellent Unicode support for a number of years not just strings, so much more. And sometimes the challenge is to even know that there is so much more. So there's dozens of classes, that uh, functions, that are available to you in order to do Unicode processing. And I'm going to yeah, show them somehow all together on this slide. So in any talk, there is one slide, and that is the slide that you want to bookmark, you want to take a picture of. This slide shows a couple of things. The first thing that shows is that you clearly you should never let me do diagrams ever again, because I'm terrible at graphics. But the second thing it tries to show is that just how many different facilities are inside Qt that let you do different things. Uh, of course, yes, there are the data containers, Qstring, the most important class of them all, Qbyte array, and other ancillary things. There are the view classes. There is a bunch of algorithms that are not even in Qstring itself, but in associated classes. There is a whole deal of classes that deal with encoding and transcoding things in and out, in and out of Qstrings. Uh, there is uh, locales and internationalization, and that's the first and the last time I'm going to spell out that word, I-18N. Uh, and there is, of course, painting. Okay, if you need to draw your text, uh, some Unicode text on the screen, how do you make sure that you're drawing it correctly, how do you make sure that your text fits where it's supposed to fit, and so on and so forth. Okay, a bunch of other classes right there in the corner. So this talk, yeah, wants, will kind of guide you through some of these classes, some, some, uh, through some of these use cases. And I think very gently, most to, as I said, inspire you to understand, oh, wait, I think I have this use case in my application. I should probably look out for which Qt class can implement that use case. Now, as a mandatory part of any <laughs> Unicode talk, let me give you the 60-second introduction to Unicode encodings, because this is going to be relevant in just a second. So suppose that you have that string. Hola to my, all my Spanish friends. That's a string which begins with an upper side, upside down exclamation mark, hola, exclamation mark, hand emoji. That string in Unicode is represented by a sequence of code points. So what Unicode does is that it defines a number for each character of that string. That number is an index into a database, the universal character set. It's usually represented by an uppercase U followed by four or more X, X digits, and it's also got a proper name. So that string can be represented by that sequence of numbers, so that sequence of code points. Now, suppose that I want to transmit that string to someone else. Okay, I could send code point by code point, but how do I do that exactly? That is the question. Do I just send? The whole digit, well, that, I could do that, but that would be extremely expensive in the general case because most of the numbers are kind of on the low side. So for that, Unicode has defined some va variations of encoding for, uh, code unit, for code points. 
There are at least three major encodings defined by Unicode itself, depending on whether you want to encode 8 bits at a time, 16 bits at a time, or 32 bits at a time. Um, nobody in the world uses UTF-32. Everybody st is still on uh, UTF-8 or UTF-16. And if I do just as an exercise to, to show you something quite interesting, uh, if we encode this string, the string we started with, uh, so this sequence of code points in UTF-8 and UTF-16, those are the bytes that you generate. Those is, that's, for instance, what you would transmit on a network or save in a file. And there is already something quite peculiar that people should understand about this. That is, if you look at some positions inside this table, namely over there, over there, over there, you notice that some code uh, points encode to multiple code units. All right? All these encodings are variable length. So over here, you can see that that first thing encodes to two code units in UTF-8. But look towards the end. There are uh, code points that encode to multiple code units in both UTF-8 as well as UTF-16. Okay? These encodings are not a one-to-one -one mapping. And that's probably a common source of bugs in any Qt software I've encountered to assume that once you have a string, once you have some bytes, a sequence of UTF-8 or even worse UTF-16 things, the length of the encoded form matches the number of characters in the string. That is absolutely not the case. All right? So, recap. Code point, an index of a character. Code unit, unit of an encoding. 8 bits for UTF-8, 16, 32 bits. And a code point gets encoded in one or more code units. OK, that's the end of the story. Now, let's talk what cute facilities to store and manage this stuff. First thing first, of course, yes, I had to talk a little bit about string and view classes in Qt. I asked before, how many string classes are there in Qt again? How many view classes are there again in Qt? <sighs> many. All right, so um, depending on which encoding you want to manage and depending on what you want to do with it, uh, Qt ships with a bunch of uh, uh, view classes, one perhaps for each encoding, and also a couple of string classes. All right, so this table tries to do some sort of mapping between which encoding you want to store your data in and which class you should use in Qt. You can see pretty clearly, Qt really does not support anything but UTF-16 for storage, if we're talking about proper string encoding. Yes, there is Qbyte array, which you can use for US ASCII. I will have a couple of words about that in just a second. On the other hand, Qt offers a bunch of view classes. All right, uh, QStringView, of course, everybody probably knows already that one. Uh, Qlatin1 string, that recently got renamed into Qlatin1 string view. It's the same class as before. Uh, and many others, what's the deal with that Q UTF-8 string view, and also what's the last one, Q any string view, new stuff in Qt6. So, to give you the quick recipe, if you're dealing with strings in Qt, which class should you use? Uh, don't overthink this, your choice as of today, please if you watch this talk three years from now, maybe things have changed, but your choices today should be this one. If you need a string class, use QString, that's the, the one to go, and if you need a view class, use QStringView. Okay, I'm not going into detail about when you should use views, when you should use strings. It's not this talk. There is a, that's a string classes in Qt talk. But these are the two ones that de facto are used everywhere in Qt. So why do I say that? Yes, that's the reason. Uh, the entirety of Qt APIs is still built around the QString, so UTF-16 encoding. And these two are, only the are the only classes where do you do actually have a proper feature set. So you, everything you can expect out of a string class or out of a string view class is only present at the moment in the QString and the QString view. If you take a look at the other view classes, their API at the moment is extremely minimal. So they just support things like uh, iteration over it. They don't support much of a string class API. Uh, and the API between QString and QString view lightly, so I say in Qt6, but I should probably mention Qt6.2, is actually symmetric, meaning that the QString view is finally all the const subset of QString, which is something I should have done a long time ago, but it's not. Uh, and this makes QString view and QString interoperability a bit different before Qt6. Uh, so what's the deal with all the others? So why do I say, hey, wait a second, should not you be using QLating one string anymore? Should not you be using uh, QUTF8 string view? 
Uh, I would say yes, but only if you know what you're doing. Okay? There is probably, that's probably a subject of another hour long discussing the subtle differences between all these classes and how to micro optimize the hell out of them. Thankfully, there is a nice, very nice tool uh, called Kledzi that uh, colleagues of mine at GitHub started development a few, uh, some time ago. And uh, I think a long time where Qt6 got released, the, this check got added, Qt6, Qlating one string char to you check, got added. Uh, that's a check that uh, uh, tells you where you could change some usage of a Qt string into something like Qlating one string or so on. So it tries to tell you, look, you could optimize this code just a little bit better. Just running polling the audience, how many of you know what Clazy is? Can you raise your hands? Yeah, I take it it's probably one third of the audience, all right? For the other two thirds who don't know what Clazy is, take a picture of this slide and uh, search for it afterwards. It's a static code analyzer that is uh, based on Clang. These days it's actually integrated into Qt Creator, so if you're using a recent version of Creator, I think it's even enabled by default and will tell you, uh, hey, you're doing some mistake when it comes to some cute related API. Uh, this specific track, however, you have to enable it explicitly. It's not enabled by default, so you need to go somewhere into the creator options and uh, toggle it in order to have it. All right. Uh, then there's another question, which is the question about byte arrays. So there are other two classes in Qt, Qt byte array and its corresponding view, Qt byte array view. Sometimes I see these used to store string data, but these are not meant to be storing any string data. Uh, the tendency, the trend uh, between Qt5, Qt6, and hopefully also towards Qt7 will be to remove all the string-related processing from these classes. There is already a source code break here. Uh, Qt array has a few functions, stuff like to upper, to lower, and something like that, that is supposed to manipulate it as it, it was a string. And already this has changed uh, between Qt5 and 6, because for instance, in Qt5, this stuff manipulated the string as a late in one string, but in Qt6, it manipulates as US ASCII. So if you add some nice late in one accident character in there, this will blow up uh, in a subtle way. Uh, my strong suggestion for you here is don't use Qt array to do string processing. I know this will not change throughout Qt6, it will be using uh, US ASCII throughout Qt6 lifetime. But what I would expect is that in Qt7, for instance, uh, these API, uh, these string-like APIs will be dropped out of Qbyte array entirely. Qbyte array is meant to store bytes, not text characters. Okay. And yes, we will need probably a replacement for this functionality, but as I said, that's still to come. There is no other string class in Qt but Qstring at the moment. Okay, thing number one. Thing number two. Okay, that's fine. I want to store Unicode string, Unicode text, I want to store it into what you just said, into a Q string. How do I even do that? How do I store Unicode stuff into a Q string? The simplest way, in your source code. So suppose that you got an interesting Unicode string. OK, maybe you're developing some software, like we do a KDAB, and you want to append a little nice copyright string that says copyright 2022. Uh, Oh God, I need to spell it out. Clara Valdens Data Consult EB. I think that was close enough. <laughs> Not even close. All right. So you add that, you put it into the label, and you show it. This is not a made up problem. OK, that's our legal name, and that's how we want our copyright to appear. Uh, if you have some about box, OK, who are the authors of the source code, and you want to have those names in there? How many of you have a name who has got a known ASCII character? I mean, just an accent, uh, diacritic, anything in there, right? Yeah. So you want your name, yeah, Andre, with an accent on ye. <laughs> yeah, okay, even the name tag <laughs> have got a unicorn failure on them. <laughs> Great. Uh, precisely, right? You want your name to be represented properly in there. So say you, you do that, and you hit build, and you hit run. What do you see on the screen? It's not a tricky question. It's an actual question. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe it's tricky. Uh, the fact that an entire audience of C++ developers don't know the answer to this question is part of the problem here. That is, this thing, such simple thing, is still a problem in C++. Uh, thankfully, Qt6 tries to crunch this problem, and also C++ upstream is trying to crunch this problem. Uh, but 
the proper answer is really, I don't know. It could be that. It's not what you would expect. It could also be that. Yeah, that doesn't look nice at all. Or it could not even compile. Your compiler can just refuse to say, what, that, what is that? I don't understand those symbols. I'm, I'm, I'm going to give you an error. Uh, it is a very unfortunate situation. So the proper answer would be it depends, which is you know, something that makes me a little bit sick. Because it depends on a huge number of factors and a huge number of defi deficiencies and fallacies within the C++ ecosystem. Uh, to be very specific, it depends on in which encoding did you save that source code. When you open up your editor and you type that stuff in and you click save, that, that file got saved in one specific encoding. Which encoding is that? Is, the encode, is that encoding the one that your compiler expects? And sometimes these two can be different. They are actually different, for instance, on Windows, typically, where any editor these days saves stuff in UTF-8, and Windows and you know, Microsoft compiler, by default, does not accept inputs in UTF-8. It accepts inputs only in uh, the uh, current code page. All right. Then, supposing that the compiler does accept it, does the compiler maintain this sequence of bytes inside the executable as they are? Or is it going to transcode them in some other char set? Yes, compilers can do that. Uh, any compiler has got a flag that can ab is able to change the so-called execution char set. And finally, whatever that string literal gets compiled into, you're passing it to QString's constructor. In which encoding does QString constructor work? Right? You have a combination of things here, and you know, three things, four things, and at any step, something can go wrong, and nothing works. And yeah, this whole situation makes me very, very sick and wants me to make puke, because every time this, I, no, you encounter this, this is a problem pretty much only in C and C++. No other programming language has this problem, because no other programming language, including QML, just mandated from the get-go the encoding throughout the, everything. The source codes are in UTF-8. We process UTF-8 strings. Our constructors take UTF-8. C++ didn't, Qt didn't for a very long time. Uh, but if you want that code to just work, TM, then the recipe for you is this one. Step number one, take your source code files, and if they are not already in UTF-8, do re-encode them in UTF-8. OK, write a shell script, write a Python script, whatever you want. Just do a pass over your repository and transcode everything into UTF-8. Step number one. Step number two, of course, configure your editors to keep the source code in UTF-8. So if you ever messed with those settings, go there and unmess with them. Keep everything in UTF-8 once you've done that. Uh, third step, compile everything in UTF-8. Uh, if you're on Linux or Unix in general, that is not a problem. That has been actually the default since 2002 or something along those lines. Uh, Unix has always used UTF-8. Uh, Microsoft is the problem, it's really the elephant in the room, uh, because UTF-8 there is not the default. And thankfully, Qt6 will be pushing for this a little bit more, because if you build uh, a project using Qt6, Qt6 will impose the UTF-8 flag on the Microsoft compiler, even on client code. So you get uh, Qt6 is imposing your source code to be UTF-8. Uh, there is an opt-out, of course, as usual. This is um, like CMake uh, magic target properties to opt-out out of this in case you don't want to. Uh, but you shouldn't want to opt-out of this. Okay, so if you're doing like a jump between Qt5 and Qt6 or something along those lines, please also follow these steps. Please also be ready for this. And the last bit would be how come that QString accepts a new TF8 string? Well, that's easy. That's because QStrings operations in general do assume UTF-8. Okay. So any char star based API uh, that has to do with QStrings assumes UTF-8 inputs. So whether you're building a string, like the first line, whether you're uh, comparing a string against a literal, whether you're using TR, all these facilities in Qt are assuming that that string, those strings, those strings are encoded in UTF-8. Okay. You, so that's cute side. Cute side is dealt with, but you need to deal with all the rest of the inputs. So make sure that UTF stuff makes it all the way through and gets in there. Uh, some other minor things that maybe you want to know about. Uh, there are other possibilities of building 
<laughs> compile time strings in Qt. Uh, there is Qstring literal. There is operator uh, double quote. All of these work, and all of these build Qstring at compile time. It's another matter of micro-optimization from a certain point of view, because these will avoid the transcoding process between UTF-8 and UTF-16 at runtime. These operators will build a UTF-16 string at compile time. The downside is that these, of course, only work with literals. They don't work with arbitrary data. I would say you should still use these facilities as a form of code hygiene. Uh, I get suspicious when I just don't see string literals wrapped in something like this. But don't worry too much about this, because once more, editors and like Clazy will tell you, I think this is a good chance for you to put Qstring literal. This is a good chance for you to put u at the beginning, like over there, followed by underscore s to make that a Qstring at compile time. How about user visible strings? How about things that you see on the screen? Uh, all of those should be wrapped by transition macros. That's another big little question of mine, uh, in, uh, in Qt, you got translation facilities. You got QObject TR, you got QObject TR and OP, and another couple of macros. Every time you got a user visible string, you are supposed to feed them into Qt by passing through these facilities. They all accept UTF-8 inputs. And sometimes I get the objection, look, I don't really need translations in my application. Why, do I, why should I need to go through these facilities? That's because that you still want to handle some aspects of language, uh, like plurals, correctly, even if you don't plan to translate your application. Okay? So uh, every time you've got something that the user can see, a string which goes on the, string, on the screen, please wrap it using the TR facilities inside Qt. Okay, one topic down, another seven to go, I guess. Yeah, this will be a long talk. I will get thrown off the stage again today. Length, sizes, and videotapes. So let's, go, let's keep talking about string and string-like classes. Uh, a very common mistake when processing text, when processing string classes, is thinking about what they actually represent. So the string classes, and I'm talking about containers and views, in Qt always deal in terms of code units. And that's not code points. And that's not units of writing. That's not visual glyphs. It's not how many things you see on the screen. OK, there are different concepts at each level. To understand what I'm talking about, suppose that you're writing a little chat application. And user can type something, and you get a little counter in a corner telling you how much the user has typed. What is that counter measuring, or what do you want it to measure? Is it the number of bytes that the user is inputting? the number of code points, the number of words, the number of visual glyphs. All these are different, semantically different entities according to Unicode. And okay, only you know the answer to this question, because those are different questions. The, uh, but you should be aware that these are different quantities. On the other side, uh, Qt offers you facilities to deal with all of these, depending on your use case. Okay. So the lowest level is the terms of storage. Okay, Qstring is encoded in UTF-16. If you ask a Qstring for its size, what you get back is the number of UTF-16 code units contained inside that Qstring. That's the lowest level. All right. So if you iterate over a Qstring, what you get back are UTF-16 code units. And unfortunately, this is at the same time a blessing and a curse. Uh, why do I say that? Because UTF-16, as an encoding, as this uh, uh, nice and not so nice <laughs> property, uh, by accident, I would say, that is that for most things, in most cases, uh, UTF, the number of UTF-16 code units in a string actually matches the number of, UTF, of Unicode code points in the string. That's because for most characters, the encoding is one-to-one. -one. Of course, there are exceptions. There are characters that encode in multiple code units. And if you didn't think about this in advance, of course, your processing will blow up as soon as I type an emoji inside your chat application. Which, by the way, actually happened in several chat applications, including the ones that we were using. OK, so you should know that uh, uh, Qstring does not contain, does not let you iterate directly on code points, only on the encoded form. 
What if you do want to iterate on uh, code points? Well, there is a facility good for that. There is a little class called QString Iterator that you can use to iterate over the, uh, the code point themselves. To illustrate the difference, here I got two little loops, one that iterates over a QString, character by character. And as you can see there, on the right-hand side, you see that the emoji is actually encoded under the form of two different uh, code units. On the right side, you see that that QString iterator class is actually giving you the, uh, the code point for the emoji. So it was able to correctly decode the string and, of course, give you the correct number of things inside the string from a uh, code point perspective. So that's one little utility that not everybody may be aware of. Sometimes we're even interested in something slightly different. That is, uh, that string before here, okay, you see that E with an accent, okay? Maybe the user didn't use a keyboard to input it in, it uses a virtual keyboard. And on that virtual keyboard, in order to make the E, you don't type the E with the accent, you type the E, and then you type the accent, and the two get glued together when you represent them visually. But somehow, the E and the accent are different things inside that string. There are two different elements that a string to represent the E with the character. Okay, that's a possibility. It just depends on how the user composes the string. So what happens if I actually want to figure out how many different units of text are in there? You've got a lot of classes for that in Qt. There is this little class called QText Boundary Finder. That class is able to iterate over a string and tell you how many graphemes the string has gotten, how many words, how many uh, lines, and stuff like that. Uh, you use it in a slightly awkward way. I don't find the API to be uh, the most the nicest, but either way, you can use this to understand how a string should decompose like that. Okay? And for instance, if you want to insert, uh, if you want to know how many characters the user has really typed, if, for instance, you're Twitter, uh, Twitter, I think, counts something like that with slight variations. Okay, it doesn't take into consideration the fact that this E is actually composed by two code points, an E plus an accent on top of it. Lastly, maybe you're not interested in that either. You're interested into some graphical properties of this specific uh, string. You want to see how the string appears on the screen. That's yet another question, to be honest, to ask Qt. Because now we enter the world of text formatting, text layouting, and fonts, which is a complicated word on its own. But as I said, Qt has an answer for that too. Suppose that you got the same string as before. Okay? I want to figure out, all right, how many visual characters do I see on the screen? Uh, the way to do so is by using this little class called Qtx layout and ask it, can you please lay out the string and tell me exactly how many uh, glyphs was, were used to display this string? And actually, for this specific string, you can get multiple sets of glyphs, because to, likely due to the emoji, you will get one set of glyphs for the text and the emoji, which is another set of glyphs. And here, the numbers could be surprising. I don't actually cannot tell you in advance what you see there, because it depends on which fonts you have installed. On the fonts on this machine, you would get that for writing a figure A, you actually get one single glyph for the F and the I, because the two get fused together form one single glyph. Okay, so if you're using this to display your text, you should know that, for instance, you can't split between the F and the I because you would break the glyph. And finally, how big is this string on the screen if I need to display it? Well, there is yet another class that takes all the other things into consideration, and that class is called QFont Matrix. You uh, build a QFont Matrix out of whatever font you want to display your string, and then you can ask different interesting questions uh, like how big is in pixels the representation of my, of my string, if there is any leading edge or trailing edge or stuff like that. Okay, more stuff. Getting string data into Qt, but not from source code, but from files or I.O. in general. Now, how do we encode and decode string data into Qt? Um, QString as a class itself can convert from and to several standard encodings. So if you open the QString documentation, you will find a bunch of calls like from Latin 1 to Latin 1, from UTF-8 to UTF-8, and so on and so forth. Uh, these are convenience functions, because if you already have 
some bytes that you know they're encoding in UTF-8. You just pass it to one of these classes, one of these functions, and you get back a uh, Q-string. And you can also do the vice versa. Uh, the more general case is, however, not handled directly by Q-string. The more general case is the one where, for instance, you may have errors in your data, and so you want to validate the data that you pass in. Maybe you cannot trust it. Maybe it's coming from the network. It's coming from some user-specified file. Uh, and the second case is where this data may actually arrive in chunks. So say you're streaming data over a socket, and you get a few bytes, and those bytes may not completely encode something, so you need to wait for more bytes to go forward. Uh, the way we do that in Qt6 is by using these two classes called Qstring Decoder and Qstring Encoder. Okay, one decodes binary data into string, one encodes a string into binary data. And these two utility classes uh, handle situations like where uh, multi-code unit sequences are split, so you need to wait for more data, or otherwise you cannot decode properly, and also all uh, errors in the incoming stream. So there is the possibility of you having uh, encoding errors. What should happen then? Should you just stop decoding? Should you try to replace the broken symbol with a default one and keep going? You can control all of that using these classes. These two classes, as of now, as I speak, are only able to decode Unicode encodings, so UTF-8, 16, 32, as well as the local encoding for the platform. If you need more codecs, say you want to decode from uh, Japanese, so from Shift JIS, uh, then you need another class. That class is called the Q Text Codec. It's a class that was only present in Qt5, and Qt6 is gone. It's, well, it's inside the Qt compatibility mode, the Qt Compat module, I think it's called. Uh, that class actually uses ICU but under the hood, so it's able to transcode everything into everything. And this is kind of a problem in general, uh, as has been pointed out quite recently, many people actually do need to transcode from arbitrary encodings. Now, when Qt6 was released, I think there was like a bet made on the fact that, uh, you know, the entire world is using uh, UTF-8 by now. We don't need to transcode anything else into anything else. Uh, guess what? <laughs> that bet was wrong. Uh, many people still need to handle non-UTF encodings. Uh, so, at the moment, this is kind of a feature lost in, uh, from Qt5 to Qt6. You still need Qtext coded from the Qt5 compatibility mode. Uh, however, uh, as of recently, this should be coming back in uh, the Qstring encoder and Qstring decoder API in Qt6.4. So, if you really need to do this kind of transcoding, please be aware of the fact that you may need to adapt the code a little bit uh, between Qt5 and Qt6. You need either Qtext coding for the compatibility, or you should subscribe to that patch and check whether it makes it through uh, in Qt 6.4, uh, or you need to wait even further uh, for 6.5. I don't know the situation at the moment. All right. Uh, some extra decoding stuff. If you have a Qstring that represents a file name, okay, the user types a file name somewhere, and you want to pass that file name to native APIs, which is the right function to call? It's one of these two, qfile encode name and qfile decode name. Uh, the reason is that the local, eh, the local encoding for file names can, be, can change from operating system to operating system. It's not necessarily the local 8-bit codec, because usually it's not even 8 bits. Windows and Mac don't use 8-bit codecs. They use UTF-16. Uh, and you shouldn't like, improvise how to do translation. How do I pass a file name that I got inside a Qstring to my open syscall? You encoding using one of these two functions. Well, in that case, it's the code name, sorry, encode name, and you pass it to the syscall. Uh, when doing I.O., so say you want to stream some data into a, uh, into a file, Qt also has facilities for that, things like Qt Stream, for instance. Those classes also support encoding when streaming out and when streaming in. They have these APIs like, called like set codec, in which you can specify which codec. Uh, this, again, goes uh, along the same lines as the other decoders. Only UTF encodings are, supposed, are supported in Qt 6. If you have files that were encoded in any other encoding, uh, then you have a problem. That is, you can't use this facility anymore. Uh, you need to do decoding on your own before feeding data into Qt Stream, which is a quite problematic thing to do. Uh, it's, it's really something that we need to solve within Qt, to be honest. 
And a similar situation applies to queue settings, and this is also even more subtle. So queue settings can save uh, settings in different places. One of these places is to save settings inside any files. In Qt6, once more, the default has been chosen to be UTF-8. That's how we're going to save our settings files. In Qt5, it was using another encoding, which was not even UTF-8 itself. It was not even the local encoding, it was something else either. And uh, now this, this opens a portability problem, because if you've got some settings file and you want that file to work in both Qt5 and in Qt6, you need to force the encoding in Qt5. So in Qt5, you need to add some versioning, uh, some version calls like that one there. That function that the encoding is gone in Qt6, because the encoding is UTF-8, but in Qt5, you need to force it, otherwise you cannot load, you cannot have any files compatible with both of the worlds. Yep, that's, that's, a that's the consequence. Localization, one more <laughs> Unicode topic. Okay. Unicode and its databases don't just give you text and strings. Uh, they also give you the correct way to do a lot of uh, user-visible text processing. For instance, formatting of things like numbers, dates, byte quantities, currencies, sorting, folding of strings, and so on and so forth. Different cultures and different languages want to see strings, want to see quantities formatted in different ways. And you're always supposed to use local aware formatting when presenting data to users somewhere on the screen, or maybe even, I don't know, in a printed report, and stuff like that. Uh, the class to use for all of this is called QLocal. Okay, that's the class that you want to use every single time you want to present some data to the user. All right? So suppose that you got a label and you want to say you know, the file size is that many bytes and the file got modified on that particular date, okay, you have to go through, you should go <laughs> through QLocal to format the, uh, the number of bytes and the string and, uh, the, and the date. Yes, even the number of bytes. If you take a look from uh, US English to Italian, you see that the formatting is different. Italians use the comma for uh, the decimal separators. US English people use the dot. Now, maybe it's just me, but I do like when people are used to this, uh, when people don't feel alien in a user interface that starts using different symbols for different things. And yes, you also get translations for the, the uh, day in the week, for the months, and so on and so forth. Okay, QLocal should be the only way to present any sort of localized data to the user, uh, whether it's numbers, whether it's dates, whether it's currencies, whether it's even, in this case, bytes. How many of you knew that QLocal can format quantities as bytes. Raise your hand. Yeah, one person. No, okay, more than one. Two or three. Okay, and they all work for KDAB. Okay, <laughs> right? Yeah. Uh, so all this stuff has to go through there. Now this doesn't mean that you cannot do also formatting using other classes. If you take a look at QString, QString also has functions to format numbers. If you take a look at QDataTime, QDataTime also has got a two-string function that is able to, uh, to format uh, the date. But uh, one tendency here, one trend, is that these things are always going to happen in US English. And by the way, this was not the case in Qt5. In Qt5, this was using the system locale. So if you have code within, if you have code within your application which is using QDate time to string, QDate to string, and was expecting that stuff to be localized, that stuff is no longer localized in Qt6. It was localized in Qt5. Uh, big warning here, if you are in the process of porting your code from Qt5 to Qt6, port your stuff to QLocal before migrating to Qt6, because this behavior has changed. And we'll probably stay like this, because this is the correct way. The low-level classes use CLocal, and we got QLocal for uh, presenting data to the users. Finally, just like last couple of slides, because Jesper is about to kick me out of stage. Uh, sorting of strings. If you have a list of strings and you want to sort it in a way that the user can see it, you're not ever supposed to call operator less than between Q strings. Once more, operator less than <laughs> between Q strings will compare code units, not even code points. The operator less than comparison on Q string is, in my opinion, completely meaningless, because it doesn't do anything 
which has got any practical semantic, uh, and uh, even worse, you, cannot, you typically don't even want to sort based on code points themselves, because sorting use of, use of visible strings actually, unfortunately, <laughs> depends on the use of language. There are languages in which different, for which different characters should compare equal, or one should come before other, or the other way around. You need to ask QLocal to sort for you. How do we do that? There are a couple of ways. The first easiest way is not use operator less than to sort strings, but use another little niche function in uh, uh, QString, which is called local aware compare. That's what you should use every time you want to compare two strings according to the current local. Uh, in general, that function uses another class in Qt, which is called QCollator, which is able to sort for any local of your choice, including the current one. But QCollator used uh, carefully actually does much more than that. It's able to sort uh, according to a locale, in case sensitive or case insensitive way. It can ignore punctuation if there is punctuation inside the string and maybe you want to skip over that. Uh, and it may also honor uh, numbers present into the string to sort them in a human readable way. Uh, what do I mean by that? Well, suppose that you got these three strings, like file one, file 100, file nine. If I have to sort those and show them to a user, you should probably like, you want to see file one, file nine, file 100. If you, if you sort them in the trivial way, of course, this is going to print uh, one, 109, but that's not what you want. So the way, a way to sort this in a proper, uh, correctly is by using, again, QCollator, telling the collator you want to sort numerically, and then you sort the list and you print it, and this will print one, uh, nine, 100. And yeah, OK, there is even more than this, but uh, that's probably enough for a uh, one-hour talk. Uh, there's text rendering, there's, there's text security, there's other parsing that all these facilities in Qt are using Unicode for. But I will shut up now, and I'm here <laughs> and take some, for, some questions for you. Thank you very much for listening. So you must have been with us for a long time before the onboarding process, took th people to the forest in the middle of Sweden, teaching them to say, Klare Elvdalen start consult. Yes. <laughs> okay. Thank you for fixing that. <laughs> Questions? There's one Andrew. over there. Sorry. Run, over here. Andrew. Hey, um, I'm probably missing something obvious. I'm going to open the can of worms, but UTF-8 used for the file, the queue settings, and mm -hmm. the input to queue string and everything. So why does queue string use UTF-16 as the storage internally, and will that ever change to UTF-8? Uh, so, so why does queue string use UTF-16? Um, well, I wasn't there when this decision was made. I can only guess, but maybe if there is somebody who was there, please correct me. Uh, there was a, I can believe, there are at least two reasons, all right. Uh, one is kind of a trend which was going on in the 90s of using UTF-16 kind of aggressively. <coughs> Java, <coughs> right? <laughs> uh, the other one is that indeed UTF-16 uh, is a very good compromise when it comes to uh, characters in like every spoken language, because you always need like one UTF-16 uh, code uh, unit to represent the spoken language code points. Uh, to be specific, it's, I'm talking about the, you know, the first 16 bits uh, uh, inside the Unicode character set. Universal character set are the basic multilingual plane. Uh, most of the spoken language characters are in there. And so uh, as form of encoding, in a general sense, it, uh, it's as efficient as UTF-8 in terms of sides, because you're going to need at least two UTF-8 uh, code units to encode spoken languages. That's 16 bits. OK, so how about just using one 16-bit uh, uh, unit of UTF-16? OK, so the trade-off there is not even in memory. Uh, on the other hand, I would just assume that, of course, yeah, 
making people more aware of the fact that UTF-16 is still a variable length encoding uh, would help. That's apparent when you use UTF-8. You know from the get-go, OK, I can't just read one byte at a time. I need to decode. You also need to do the same with UTF-16. Yes, and that's not really apparent. Uh, there are, I encountered countless bugs uh, where people were, were under this assumption, and you know, as soon as you throw an emoji at them, the code blows up. And you cannot say, no, my code does not support emojis. Uh, it's 2022. You, you cannot say that anymore. Uh, but I don't know if I did answer your question. So uh, it, it, uh, to me, it's mostly a, like an historical choice that is still a kind of reasonable compromise in the common case, because you're going to need 16 bits of data anyhow to process spoken languages. Uh, and UTF-16 could make that slightly easier in a, in a, in a few scenarios. Uh, but I literally was not there when this decision was made in 1994, so uh, <laughs> along those lines. <laughs> yep. Question over here. Hi. Uh, my question is related to um, validation and regular expressions. So mm -hmm. using Unicode, is there an easy way to maybe let the user only write a certain plane or... Uh, Unicode uh, characters, or even if I know that the, in the end uh, the string that the user is input will be uh, encoded in a specific encoded that doesn't support any uh, all. How, how is, is there a fast way using a regular expression to maybe uh, let the user only insert specific characters? Um. So is it a question about something like, uh, like applying validators to yeah. something like input yeah. widgets? Yeah. Uh, some. So in the general sense, you could do that, yes. Uh, things like uh, Qline Edit, just to say a widget, uh, does support uh, input validation. And uh, QRegular Expression, which I didn't mention, uh, just because I don't, don't like to do like, self-promotion, but I wrote it, uh, does support Unicode. So you could build a, a regular expression that uh, rejects things based on Unicode properties. Say, I don't want anything but uh, uh, digits and only yeah. within this range and uh, whatnot, and then the user will not be able to input characters in there. So yes, you, you can certainly build something like that. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. One more question? Well, I can... Uh, totally be on the same page as you there when it comes to Clacy. For those of you that haven't used Clacy yet, it is a must-have tool in your toolbox. And uh, funny enough, there is uh, actually on YouTube, there is uh, this Cute Widgets and More that has uh, two episodes on, on running Clacy and its counterpart, Clang Tidy. So uh, if you don't use those <laughs> oh, yet, it's not on the screen. <laughs> definitely need to go and do that. Uh, yes, please. I mean, there is... If there's something that in C++ is tremendously important, is tooling, all right? You should use as much tooling as you can. Uh, since most of this tooling is free, and some of this comes even integrated within Qt Creator, please use it all. Uh, it really makes no sense for you not to use some free available tooling and improve your source code or you know, detect mistakes as you're typing. Uh, it's really the best thing in the world. And if you're using Qt Creator, you might actually already be using Clang Tidy and Clacy. Notice these errors that are printed on your line when you type code. Well, on mine, I guess. Not everybody writes as crappy code as I do. Anyway, <laughs> if you're interested in low-code Qt apps with Design Studio and SCXML, you'd have to get up and move uh, four floors up. Otherwise, cross-platform CI, CD, set up, make it easy is in here starting at a 10 minutes past 10. So uh, shall we give him a last big hand? Thank you.